Hello and welcome everyone. It's wonderful to have you here today. My name is Abby and on behalf of Happify, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar, Learning to Live and Thrive After a Loss. I'm thrilled everyone could be with us today. This past year definitely hasn't been one of the easiest, but I sincerely hope that today serves us all as a time to be present and find some comfort in being here together. And with that, I am so honored and excited to present our speaker. Shelby Forsythia has been a student of grief after the death of her mother in 2013. She set out on a lifetime mission to study the human experience of loss. Through a combination of practical tools and intuitive guidance, she helps people grieving death, divorce, diagnosis, and major life transitions reclaim their power and peace of mind. Shelby is the author of Your Grief, Your Way, which was just released in September, and also the other book, Permission to Grieve. She also hosts three podcasts, Grief Book Review, Grief Seeds, and Coming Back, Conversations on Life After Loss. Her work has been featured on HuffPost, Bustle, and O, oh, the Oprah Magazine. We are so happy to have you here with us today, Shelby. And with that, I will turn it over to you. Hi there, everyone, and uh, hello to whatever time of day it is, wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, something that I would love to ask you right away is if you have a favorite comfort TV show or comfort movie, something that I hear about so often when working with clients who are grieving death, divorce, and diagnosis is, yeah, I'm watching this one show or this one movie over and over and over again. And uh, statistically, that's something that brings us a great amount of comfort, not only because it's repetitive, but oftentimes because the things we choose have predictable endings we remember the characters and it's something that feels um, wrapped up and finite at a time when we are living in great uncertainty. Somebody said golden girls, golden girls. I'm seeing a lot. That's mine as well. <laughs> so I'm so glad that that's such a popular one. Looks like 51st dates, anything on the Hallmark channel, uh, the holiday, more golden girls in here. I've got bewitched ghost. I love watching the chat and seeing your responses. And this is going to be a very interactive call today. Um, I'm really excited to be here with you and sharing tips for emotionally validating the life that we're living after loss. And this is especially pertinent right now as we are all existing in a world that continues to uh, be saturated with the reality of COVID-19 and its aftermath and its continuation. But also we may have lost loved ones this year. We may have gone through divorces or major breakups this year. We may have received diagnoses that changed our lives forever. And a lot of how we can help ourselves and help other people in the aftermath of loss is by helping normalize our own and others' emotions like anxiety and despair, by giving ourselves and other people permission to grieve, and by actually transmuting these losses into rituals, into memorials, and even through physical items like mementos to carry these losses and integrate loss with us in our day-to-day -day life, as opposed to demanding this loss be tucked away or shoved away in some corner only for it to burst forth at really inopportune times. Um, I'm getting, yeah, the notebook, the Goldboro, Shit Creek, um, Shit's Creek, uh, and then the office, the office is a major one I've heard from clients as well. So I'm really excited for you to be here with me today. And I'll be asking questions. You'll see some polls pop up during our conversation as well. Um, and at this moment, I'm going to uh, jump into our presentation for today. So welcome. This is Learning to Live and Thrive After Loss. So if you're looking to live and thrive after loss, you're definitely in the right place. And thank you again for taking uh, an hour out of your day to join me here. I kind of want to... Um, lay the groundwork before we start of two major definitions that are really important talking about grief and loss. So the definition of loss is any expected or unexpected occurrence where you cannot go back to the way things were before. So I often refer to loss as a doorway event where once you cross the threshold of this event, you cannot go back to the way things used to be. This can be death. The most common one known in our westernized societies is death, but also divorce diagnosis, maybe a geographical move. You have to move across the country for work can also be something like a natural disaster. So like Hurricane Katrina can also be um, a political or, or social event. So I'm thinking something like 9-11 or a terrorist attack, but can also be the birth of a child 
going through puberty, a graduation, or a job promotion. So something where you cross through a doorway, something happens in your life, a metaphorical doorway, and you cannot go back to the way things were before. So you can't unknow information. You can't unsee a sight. You can't unhear a sound. It's something has been gained in a loss. I can't go back to the way things were before, but I have also gained information or wisdom or knowledge or an experience that I can no longer get rid of. I can't undo what that was. So absolutely death, divorce, diagnosis, but also less conventional things like uh, birthing a child, um, going through puberty, experiencing a job promotion or graduating, walking across that stage. Your life has changed forever and cannot go back to the way things were before. Different than loss is grief. And grief is kind of the response to loss. So when you go through that doorway, how are you feeling? What happens after you go through that doorway in your body, in your heart, in your mind, in your soul, in your spirit, if those are things you believe in? Um, the collection of normal and natural emotions that follows a loss as you're going through this doorway, as you've gone through this doorway, what are you feeling in the aftermath? This can include sadness and anger, which is what's most often portrayed in our movies and our music and our TV series uh, that we mentioned, especially at the beginning here, but can also include things like numbness, so kind of being tuned out or distant from the world as if there's a, a pane of glass, like transparent glass or translucent glass separating you from the world around you. Confusion is a really big one. A lot of my clients and I talk about something called grief brain, where you forget where things are. Essentially, your keys are in the freezer, <laughs> um, which is really, really common or forgetting what you were going to say, or you walk into a room and you kind of forget why you came in there. And also guilt, regret, remorse, things unsaid, left unsaid, unfinished business, and also things like anxiety, waiting for the other shoe to drop, constantly being on the lookout for more things to go wrong, something like hypervigilance is very common in the aftermath of loss, but also joy in the aftermath of grief and maybe not in the immediate aftermath. So for me to say joy after a loss, a lot of people get really angry and that's very, very normal. Um, but grief is lifelong. It's all of the emotions, all of the experiences that follow us throughout the rest of our lives. And so part of grief and loss is kind of how do we incorporate our loss into experiences that are joyful, like milestone events, weddings, more graduations, other ceremonies that we do with other people. Yeah, absolutely. Really, really common. Yes, I'm seeing in the chat, grief fog is such a thing, and you are absolutely right about that. This is one of my favorite uh, diagrams to show people because we feel a lot of things while grieving. We can feel total despair, powerlessness, helplessness, hopelessness, uncertainty, not knowing what's going to happen tomorrow or maybe even in the next hour as a result of loss, not knowing how we are going to survive without this person in our lives, not knowing how we're going to survive with this piece of information or this diagnosis or this thing that has permanently changed. And also there is a complete opposite end of the spectrum of, I wish you were here. I wish you could be a part of this. Um, I'm getting married. I'm having a child. I'm experiencing these wonderful, beautiful life events, even literally or figuratively stopping to smell the roses and noticing a beautiful day. Seeing a loved one through signs and symbols can be something that feels very uplifting or spiritually connecting. And then there's the emotions that society allows, which is about this big in grief. Society has all of these invisible and visible criteria about how we're supposed to grieve in the aftermath of loss. You're supposed to be sad, but only sad about these things. You can't have regrets. Uh, even if somebody was a bad person or an abuser to you in life, you have to sanctify them or make them a really wonderful person in death. You can't speak ill of the dead. You can be angry, but only for the first year. And after that, you have to stop talking about them anymore. If you lost a child due to miscarriage, that's not the same as losing a baby or a child that got to live more life out on the planet. So your loss is not valid. There's all these hierarchies of emotions and experiences that society allows in our grief. And yet what we feel as human people is so much bigger. Um, so I want to propose a question to you. And that is, who do you feel safe sharing this wide spectrum of emotions with? Is this people like friends and family? Is this um, a romantic partner? Is this a co-worker? Is this somebody else? Or do you not feel safe sharing emotions with anybody, which is a really, really valid experience. So on your screen, you should see a poll pop up and I would love to know who you feel the most safe sharing emotional experiences with kind of beyond what society allows. And I'll give you a couple minutes to kind of hang out um, with that as a question. 
Yeah. I know for me, um, in the aftermath of my loss, I think I had a couple of friends, maybe a handful, and then uh, maybe one or two family members that made the cut. And I have a fairly large family. Yeah. Let's see what that poll said. 50% of people said a friend. Yes, trusted friends are often the best people to hold space for our emotions or validate what's going on for us. We're going to be talking about emotional validation today. Uh, closely following at 41% a family member, closely following that a romantic partner. Less people said a coworker um, or someone else. And then about 20% of people on the call today said no one or I do not feel safe. And I want to validate right now that this is a really common experience to not feel safe sharing emotional experiences with anybody, because there are definitely fears of being judged. There are fears of being perceived as weird or crazy or kind of outside the margins or not over it yet. I am not healed from this experience. And that can be really, really hard to, um, for lack of better phrasing, kind of open the trap door to your heart space and say, hey, this is what's going on for me right now. Yes. And so something that actually really helps with being able to share these emotions, either with other people or to validate them for yourself as real, is something that I wrote about in my first book called Permission to Grieve. And what this actually ties back to is a psychological concept known as emotional validation. And there was this tremendous study done in 2017, uh, I had to write his name down, by the name of Gregory Witkowski in 2017 about emotional validation. And he did this study and essentially found that when people validate each other's emotions, when they say, yes, that's real, yes, that's true, this matters, I care about this happening. Not only do you make people feel okay about the emotional experience they're having at the time, you let them have that emotion or spectrum of experiences, but also you help them feel like they have the power or the ability to do something about it. You empower them to change their lives or step into a place where they feel like, okay, not only am I allowed to have this emotion, but maybe I'm going to be okay. Maybe something better is coming my way. So this idea of permission to grieve, how do we give ourselves permission to grieve? How do we normalize the emotions that we're feeling that are so much wider on this spectrum? That's what we're gonna be learning about today. So jumping into this space, um, huh, I would love to hear in the chat some of the wild and insensitive things that you've heard of in the aftermath of losses. Again, loss can be death, divorce, diagnosis, but any other transition in your life. So many of my clients say they've heard Look on the bright side. You are being too sensitive. You are too much. You cry too much for this space, or you are too angry to be in this meeting right now. Or they kind of offer the guilt trip mode of they wouldn't want you to feel X, Y, Z, as in your dead person would not want you to be having this experience in life. But in reality, you're kind of having it anyway. So that makes you feel doubly bad. So not only am I not allowed to have this emotion, but then my person who died wouldn't want this for me either. So now I feel guilt and regret about this whole experience. And a way to emotionally validate people to normalize these bigger spectrum emotions like anxiety and despair is to say something like, of course, of course you're feeling upset that somebody you don't really like is pregnant after you've just suffered a miscarriage. That makes so much sense that somebody, a celebrity, um, a friend of the family who's maybe not so much a friend starts posting all these pictures on Instagram with her belly and everything, and you just lost the dream and the reality of a child. Of course you would be upset that somebody you don't really like is pregnant. Something else you can say to people or to yourself to normalize these emotions, I can see how you got there which can really help with things um, when people feel like they're crazy for sharing an emotion, or maybe when you feel like you're crazy for having an emotion. I know um, in the aftermath of my mother's death, I felt so angry. I was furious all the time. And uh, people would tell me to calm down. People would tell me she's dead. So just get over it. There's going to be no resolution to this. And the people who were most validating to my emotions were people that normalize them. I can see how you got there. I can see why you're angry. I can see why this is something that really matters to you. And lastly, it makes sense that you would feel X, Y, Z instead of your person wouldn't want you to feel this way, which is more the angle of the guilt trip. But instead, it makes sense that you would feel like you're not allowed to be yourself in public spaces, or it makes sense that you would feel numb to the world right now of course. And you can use all of these in combination with each other to validate other people's emotions as they're sharing their grief experiences with you, but yours as well. So when you're kind of winding yourself up into the stratosphere of like, I can't believe I'm so angry about this. It's been 10 years since he died. And I can't believe that this is still on my mind. And I can't believe there's so much unfinished business. And why am I this person? And I feel so bad and wrong for feeling this way. 
if you take a breath, sometimes you can hold your heart. Sometimes you can look in the mirror and do this word, this work. It seems a little bit cheesy, but you can offer yourself. It makes sense that you would be angry that your dad died and left your brother everything in the will, even 10 years later. Yeah. How does that feel in your space to validate yourself in these moments? So I want to ask you, and I'll come out of um, this uh, slideshow presentation, hang out with you for a bit. Think of a time when somebody made you feel overly sensitive, ridiculous, weird, or too much for having a feeling. And then what do you wish that they'd said instead? And I would love, if you feel comfortable sharing in the chat, I would love to have you there. Um, if not, that's A-OK -okay too. One of my um, most vivid experiences of this is actually about two or three months after my mom died. My mom died when I was 21. I was in college. She unexpectedly had a recurring occurrence of breast cancer that she'd had about a year before. And it came back and in a week she was gone. And I returned to college in the spring semester. She died over winter break on the day after Christmas and returned to college in the spring semester. And her death was just always on my mind. It was like I had a record player that said, um, your mom is dead. Your mom is dead. Your mom is dead. Your mom is dead. It was playing on constant repeat to all the classes that I went to, through all the plays I directed, through all the jobs that I worked in that final semester of college. And I remember I was in a political science class in my last semester in college. And unbeknownst to me, there was not a syllabus for this course. Unbeknownst to me, we were covering political funerals that day. And that day happened to be the 26th of the month of February, which was exactly two months after my mom died. And I was obsessively counting the months after she died. So the 26th of every month was very important to me because it marked another month that she was no longer on the planet. And I was just ripped apart. I was shredded to pieces on the inside. So I was sitting in this class and we saw on video, we were watching a video about political funerals, about famous figures who had died. And there was the funeral procession for John F. Kennedy. And as the casket was going by, as the horses were parading, as Jackie O was stepping out of the car with her birdcage and her black dress on, I just could not handle being in that class anymore. So I got up, I took my bag, I went out into the hall and I immediately burst into tears. And I returned to the classroom after the class was over because I'd forgotten to take one of my notebooks with me. And my professor was more or less, well, what was that about? And I told her, I said, my mom died two months ago, as you know, and this is the 26th that marks two months since she's been gone. And this date's just really upsetting for me. And you know what she said? You cannot let a date rule the rest of your life. And in that moment, I was so gutted. I felt weak for caring about a number on the calendar. And I also felt unheard by her because she didn't care about my pain. She cared that something had happened to make me leave her class. And it was absolutely devastating to me. Um, and I wish she had said something like, of course, you're still counting the days since your mother died. She died two months ago. Or of course, a lesson on political funerals would be upsetting to you after you just had to attend one for your mother in real life. There were so many different things she could have said in that moment, and yet she chose not to. Yeah, let's see. Um, yes, I'm getting in the comments. They would want you happy. Uh, they're in a better place. Yes, these are all the offensive things that people say to us. Yes. Um, and then Monica says, even just I understand would have been better. Yes, something that feels like empathy or connection across the way. Um, Michelle says, my stepdad died. He raised me and I was upset. My boss was uncaring and cold. It happened while I was at work and all I needed was a hug. My director at the time stepped up, hugged me and allowed me space to cry. Yes. And so sometimes it's not even words that open the door to emotional validation and normalization of emotions emotions, but sometimes it's it's uh, physical gestures, but oftentimes door, uh, the doors opening to emotional validation, the doors opening to that physical component of it as well starts with the words that we say to each other because we let each other know that we're safe places for grief and loss. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes, that makes perfect sense. Any other things? Uh, Donna says, sometimes people say, I can't imagine what you're going through. It's the best thing rather than pretending that they do understand. Yes, and that's actually a controversial phrase in the grief community. So sometimes people saying, I can't imagine what you're going through is like, no, you can't. And thank you for validating that because this is my experience and mine alone. But sometimes people say, I can't imagine what you're going through. And what they mean is they don't want to. 
imagine what it's like to experience such a loss. And so it's almost as if they're keeping themselves at an arm's length from your grief. Yes. Um, and Ron says, for me, one of the worst things a person can say is to start telling me a story of their loss. Yes. And there's kind of a trumping, a trump card. Well, you think that's bad. Let me tell you about this one. And I'm laughing, but in the moment, it's absolutely devastating. And I wish in that moment for you, Ron, that people would come in and say, oh my gosh, that sounds so hard for you. I can see why that's important to you. Tell me more which opens that door to emotional validation and normalization. I'm going to pop back into the slideshow now, but please feel free to keep sharing stories in the chat. It looks like so many of you are resonating with each other and with their stories. So kind of next up in here, we have already shared some things in the chat that sound like permission to grieve blocking. So I am not allowing you permission to grieve. Aren't you over it by now? Here's a big one. You need to be strong for others. You're not allowed to have emotions. You are a fortress or a place of safety for other people. So you can't break down. You can't be weak. You can't have a weak spine about this. You can't feel bad about what the, what kind of example are you setting, especially if you're a boss or in some kind of leadership position in your workplace. There's definitely this fear of looking weak or looking affected emotionally by an event because I will be seen as incapable at my job. You need to be strong for other people. Other thing, I can't believe you're this upset. It was just a dog. It was just a grandparent. It was just a graduation ceremony, especially right now with COVID. We have a lot of people, um, I'm a millennial myself, but we have a lot of Gen Zers who are grieving rituals and memorials and rites of passage that so many of us receive that they will not get to. And one of the most harmful ways that we can block their permission to grieve is to say it was just a graduation big whoop. When in fact, this is, a, this is a threshold that they are crossing over that has great meaning to them. So if you have children or if you have children in your life, something that you can acknowledge for them is this is a really big deal for you. And I'm sorry that this isn't happening for you. So conversely, permission granting for yourself and others sounds like, let's just sit with this a moment. It's okay to feel that way. That sounds really hard. If you could have anything in the world right now, what would it be? Yeah. And these are, instead of, aren't you over it by now? You need to be strong for others. I can't believe you're this upset, which all feel to me like shut down, shut down, shut down, shut down. Let's sit with this a moment. It's okay to feel that way. That sounds really hard. If you could have anything in this moment, what would it be? When you take time to acknowledge the loss in the room and the grief emotions that you or somebody else is experiencing, you, you give them more metaphorically, but sometimes even physically room to breathe. They are allowed to be human and have this full spectrum of emotions in your presence, even if you are just validating yourself. So if I'm spinning myself up into a place of why are you so sad? I can't believe you're so devastated by X, Y, Z. And I look at myself in the mirror and say, you know what? It's okay that you feel this way. It makes sense that this is true for you right now. As opposed to Shelby, you need to be strong for others. You're a grief professional. You can't look weak. You've got other people to support. No, that's a shutdown experience. How can you be an opening experience to people and for yourself in loss and grief? Yeah. Something that's really hard for both myself and my clients is to request permission to grieve from other people. So if you're encountering somebody who keeps shutting you down, or as Ron shared earlier, who instantly starts sharing their story of grief and loss, you can ask for permission to grieve if you're not getting it already, whether this is in your family dynamic, whether this is in the workplace, whether this is in a friend circle or a friend group, you can say, whoa, 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 whoa. Can you, before you share your story of loss, can you just acknowledge that this is a really hard thing for me to go through right now? Instead of telling me I need to be strong for other people, I would rather you tell me that it's okay to have these feelings. <sighs> people say it won't last forever and this is just a blip in time in your life. It was just a graduation. I know it won't be like this forever, but I wish you could validate what I'm going through today. This is what I'm experiencing right now. You're dragging me into the future. I am here in the present, and this is what I feel today. And this can be tricky. This is another um, This is another time you are offering up yourself in a vulnerable way to people you're surrounded by to say, can you validate my grief? And I'll tell you that how people respond to your requests for permission, permission asking from others, tells you everything you need to know about them. If you say something like, can you just acknowledge this is a hard thing that I'm going through right now instead of sharing your story right away? And they say, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Yes, this is a really hard thing for you to go through right now. And I can't imagine what it must be like to be in your shoes. Can you tell me more about your mom who died? 
that's a person your grief is safe with. If somebody says, or if you say, can you acknowledge this is a hard thing to go through? And you're like, why are you so sensitive? I was just trying to help. My intentions were good. That is not a safe person to share your grief with. And so instantly in asking these questions about whether or not you have permission to grieve from other people in your life, they are telling you whether or not they are a safe place to grieve. Now, you can also give yourself permission to grieve by asking kind of more introspective questions than maybe you would to validate other people in their grief and loss. So something like, where can I be kinder and gentler to myself in my grief? So I'm feeling constricted. Where am I feeling trapped or muzzled? I'm feeling like I'm not allowed to show this emotion. Or I'm not allowed to be this person or I'm not allowed to do this thing in relation to my grief and loss. How can I make that a kinder and gentler process to myself? Can I allow myself to sleep in more? Can I cut down on crime TV? Because that has replays of things that I don't want to see because it reminds me of death. Can I... Um, even purchase something like a weighted blanket or like cozy slippers to feel surrounded by something that feels warm and loving. And if my life, my friends, and my job gave me a free pass, what would that look like? And this is an especially good question for the workplace, because if my job gave me a free pass right now, what would that look like? Would they let me take a week off work? Would they let me work half days on Fridays? Would they um, overhaul their bereavement program and allow people to have more time off work? Would they um, offer grief counseling as part of their insurance package? And so you can even approach your job or the places that you are in the world with, hey, this would give us all a lot more permission to grieve and permission to be human within the context of the workplace. So that's a really neat or interesting one to carry with you. Yeah. Um, reviewing all the ways that you can grant yourself permission to grieve. So literally just this slide before, I'll show it up again um, for the next 60 seconds or so, this right-hand column of permission granting for yourself, reading through all of these. What do you think would be some really good ways to offer permission to grieve to other people as well? And in addition to this question, I'll pop another poll up on the screen here. Who do you think it's easier to give permission to, yourself? or other people? Is it easier to hear other people's story of loss and say, yes, that's true for you. I can see why that matters. I can so understand how you got there. Or is it easier to validate your own emotions and say, it's okay that you feel angry. It's okay that you feel sad. It's okay that you feel numb to the world right now. It makes sense because you are grieving a loss. And so we'll keep that poll up here um, for just a little bit. And then I'm gonna come visit you again and we'll talk about this screen. How can you give other people permission to grieve? And I'll tell you some examples um, from my own life. Ooh, yeah, this is really common. Looks like 84% of people said it is so much easier giving other people permission to grieve. And then only 16%, it's easier giving myself permission to grieve. And this is really, really common in the aftermath of loss is it is so easy to tell other people that their emotional experiences are okay, that their losses are okay to have, that their emotions are important and they matter and they're allowed to exist, for me, higher standard. Or maybe societal standard is still where I hold this. And this, this comes from, this is a lot uh, different work that I often do with my one-on-one -on -one clients. This comes from childhood expectations, the people that we're supposed to be in the world, the dreams we have for ourselves. It's so much harder to validate our own permission to grieve. Yes, um, let's see. In the chat, if you could share some uh, ways that you could help other people have permission to grieve. Looks like Kelly says patience is really pertinent. I'll tell people, uh, Karen says my company gave three whole days to grieve a parent, spouse, or loved one very sad. So that would not be a way um, to give other people permission to grieve. Heather S says the gentle offering of sitting with feelings has been one of the kindest gestures I've received in the midst of loss, especially from others who have experienced loss for themselves, because it allows and creates a tangible space for processing when others who don't have that level of understanding may have expectations or different reactions to my grief. Yeah, that's beautiful, Heather. And I encourage everybody to scroll up and read that one. Yes. And here's Anna offering um, themselves permission to grieve. Mother's Day was super hard and sad for me. I gave myself permission to sit on the couch, binge watch shows, going back to the comfort TV and movies again, and eat Chinese food by 3.30. I felt better enough to take my dog for a walk. I think he knew I was sad because he acted, acted extra goofy for me. Yes. And pets are a tremendous way that we can give ourselves permission to grieve. So Anna, really well done on giving yourself 
permission to grieve on that one. Sometimes um, another way to reframe permission to grieve, if this is helpful for you, is what can I do to give myself permission to be human right now? Because oftentimes when we're giving ourselves permission to grieve, our expectations of who we should be in this moment or the emotions we should have, there's a lot of shoulding that happens are so ridiculously high when we can so easily extend that grace and that mercy to other people. Yeah, and so allowing ourselves to have these things like binge watching shows. For me, I phrase it as lumping around on the couch. I'm like, sometimes I just got to have a lump day where I'm lumping around on the couch. And then if I feel better by 3.30, I'm going to go for a walk and look at some birds and stuff. That's a wonderful thing. And it just allows you to be more human in the aftermath of your loss. Yes. Um, Christina says, best thing I can do for others is to check in regularly and let them know I'm thinking of them. Oh my gosh, this is tremendous and wonderful. One of my clients went so far as to schedule reminders in her calendar of when hers and when other people's grief anniversaries were. So grief anniversaries, not only on the anniversary of a death, but maybe on the anniversary of a divorce or a diagnosis. And she would get pinged a week in advance and then either send them a card, send them a photo, send them a text message, some kind of, or plan an event with them, like going on a walk or going to dinner or something like that. So other people knew in her life that she was still interested in supporting them and honoring this really hard thing that they went through at one point. Tremendous idea. Yes, and Shauna's echoing, I did that, I reach out to them. Yes. And please do not be afraid. I know this is not what this workshop is about, but please do not be afraid of reminding people of their loss. They always know that their loss is a reality in their lives. If you're afraid of, I'm going to bring up bad memories, or I'm going to remind them of something that they don't want to be reminded of, it's impossible for them to forget. And for people who have experienced a loss in this chat, you will see very quickly, I can't forget that my mother died. She is perpetually on my mind. She takes up about, well, either five to 10% of my brain space at all times. And then on really hard days, we just came out of Mother's Day, a hundred percent capacity. She is there ever present all the time. And so when somebody mentions my mom, it's not, oh, I'm getting crashed over by a wave of grief. It's, oh my God, somebody remembered that she lived. And now they're asking me about her or they're asking me how I am in relation to her grief. Yes, yes, really tremendously done in that one. Yeah, I'm gonna jump back into share screen, but please um, continue to, share memories of loved ones, and also this reality that we cannot forget our people and we cannot forget the losses that happened to us in the chat. Yeah, before we jump into the next slide or as we're jumping into the next slide, I want to know, do you know what kind of learner you are? Are you an audio learner? Are you a visual learner? Are you a tactile learner? Do you like to hear things and then they kind of land or sink in with you? Do you Are you a person that definitely needs to see things? I got to see it written down. I got to see... <laughs> I lost a ring down a kitchen sink one time and I went on YouTube to figure out how to unclog the drain, <laughs> but I had to watch a video of somebody literally undoing all the pipe work under the sink in order to figure out how to retrieve my ring from the drain. So I'm definitely a visual learner. I'll share that with you right now. Or do you need to actually touch things in the world? Are you a person who like, I need a science experiment. I need some kind of physical place where I can actually touch and physically experience the thing I'm trying to learn. Yeah, so it looks like most people, and this is statistically true for the world as well, are visual learners. Um, about 19% are audio learners, 21% are tactile learners, and six are either other or I'm not sure, which is A-OK. -okay. You don't necessarily have to know what kind of learner you are. And actually, some people are often a combination of the two. So I'm a visual learner, but if somebody can speak it at the same time that they're showing it, I will learn it a lot more quickly. So we'll start with visual learners, which is actually in the middle of this slide here. To give yourself permission to grieve as a visual learner, one of the best things you can do is to write a permission slip for yourself on a piece of paper and post it where you can see it, like a mirror or like a kitchen cabinet. And if you really like to have some fun with this, I actually get myself um, chalk markers or um, like whiteboard markers, which come easily off of windows and mirrors. And I write myself permission to grieve on windows and mirrors all over my house. And this is a fun thing to do if you have kids or if you have a spouse or if you have other family members uh, living with you, especially right now in COVID. What are you giving yourself permission to do today? and how can you visually see it? So every time you wake up and look in the mirror, every time you look out your window, you see that permission to grieve that you're giving yourself and can release yourself from these constraints of feeling like you do not have permission to have your emotions and permission to grieve. For our next group, um, tactile learners seem to be the second ranking. A really phenomenal thing to do with a memento or an, a physical object is to designate an object to represent your permission to grieve. So this could be a stone or a coin, or for me, uh, a piece of jewelry to designate permission to grieve. And when things get overwhelming, you can touch it, you can hold it, you can rub it, you can look at, take it out and look at it and kind of move it around in your hands. 
Um, and remind yourself that your feelings are normal and worthy of acknowledgement. And this can be something related to a loved one. So like a loved one's piece of jewelry um, or a coin that they held or a pocket watch or something neat that you hang on to that's a part of them. But it can also be something that you decide and you designate. I worked with a client once who um, wrote permission on a rock, like a river rock, and then just kept it in her purse all the time. And whenever things would get overwhelming or she was about to do something that she was scared of, like going to the attorney's office to sort things out after the death of her daughter, she would pull this rock out and just put it on the counter next to her. Just say permission. You have permission to feel, permission to grieve in this moment and in this space. And then lastly, we'll move up to the top for our audio learners. Speak your permissions out loud like an affirmation or a mantra and hear them in your own voice. Or if you're really close to somebody, so again, like that poll in the beginning, a friend, a family member, um, you can record it in their voice. If you use the voice memos app on your phone, or if you're old school like me and have tape recorders still, you can absolutely ask them to speak into a tape and say, you have permission to grieve. Or if you want to make it a daily practice today, I have permission to feel, for example, lonely without my dad here. I have permission to feel confused about this new diagnosis. I have permission to feel scared about what the world's going to be like post COVID. Yeah, you can make this a daily practice for yourself where you're speaking it out loud or having somebody else speak it out loud with or for you. Um, and that can help solidify in your mind and your brain like this permission. You are rewiring your brain to allow yourself that full spectrum of emotion. And for so many of you, because giving myself permission to grieve is the hardest thing to do, these are ways that you can unlock these examples of permission within yourself. Yeah. Um, I want to share two examples of permission to grieve that relate to routines and mementos from client experiences and then one from a family member as well. I worked with this client once in an online course and she so sadly lost her daughter who was trans to suicide, which is a very, very common way that LGBTQ folks die is they take their own lives because of a lack of acceptance either from family or from society or from bullying or so many other things. And she lived in this very, very rural part of Colorado. And something that we kind of composed for her to do together to give herself permission to grieve the death of her daughter who she loved dearly and continues to love, grief goes on and can even include things like joy is to take these regular trips. She has a river in her backyard, which is a really cool thing to have. Not everybody has a river in their backyard. And she would take little leaves or flower petals or blades of grass and things that floated and attach her emotions to them. This one represents anxiety. This one represents pain. This one represents fear. This one represents missing you. This one represents numbness. And just place them in the river and watch them float away. And with each of these, and she does this on a regular basis, maybe about two, three times a month or so, she'll take a trip down to the river to honor her daughter who died and give herself permission to grieve. In doing each of these things, not only did she identify each emotion as it was coming to her, which is really helpful in grief to somehow be able to put words to what you are feeling internally, but it also developed this ritual for her as this is not only when I honor myself and my grief, but to spend time energetically with the memory of my daughter and for our relationship to continue to live on and be integrated in the full picture of my life. So trips to the river are now a very significant part of how she lives her life and will continue to live her life until her own eventual death. Yeah. Um, another uh, ritual that I really want to point out that has mementos included, like physical objects, um, is one that my aunt does, actually, my mom's sister. And she shared this with me when I visited her home, uh, probably about six or seven months after my mom died. Yeah, she had one of those, um, <laughs> I think, pottery barn, but one of these uh, glass containers that has a handle on the top and you can put candles inside and a lot of people fill them with their and fill their fireplaces with them and she has this very very tall white pillar candle and every morning she wakes up walks out of her bedroom over to this candle lights it closes the little door and then goes to start her day and every time she goes to sleep she opens the little door of this glass container with the candle, she blows out the candle and she goes to bed. And this is her way of softly kind of acknowledging that my mom's presence is alive with her and follows her throughout the day. And then when she goes to bed, she's like, and now I'm kind of tucking in this memory of your mother. We have spent a full, another full day together, even though you are not here on this earth as my sister, informing how I live on the earth, informing how I interact with my children, informing how I interact with my husband, informing how I make decisions, informing how I grieve day to day, the emotions that I'm having with this candle being lit 
in a space. Um, so I'm curious if any of you all have uh, rituals or mementos, things you either hold on to, like tiny things, coins or rocks or things like that, or large uh, rituals that you do on a regular basis that involve you going somewhere or doing something in honor of grief and loss. And these are a lot more common than you think. And I hope what happens as you see each other's responses in the chat is that you give yourselves a lot more permission to grieve based on the rituals and the mementos and the memorials that other people are already doing. This is a lot more common than we express publicly out in the world. Yeah. So this is time for interactive uh, element of our presentation is to write your own permission slip. This is what the piece of paper is for or the post-it note if you have one next to you right now. If you could give yourself permission to feel anything right now regarding your grief, what would that be? And you can usually start off this statement with today I have permission to feel and then fill in the blank. You can also say something like right now I need permission to feel XYZ or you can even um, write I give you permission to feel blank and then sign your name, almost as if it's a hall pass or something in school that you would get from an authority figure or from a teacher. Some people find um, that getting a, a symbol from a higher power, <laughs> even if it's a, uh, an imaginary teacher or an imaginary principal to give you a hall pass for something, can really help give you permission to grieve. There's something psychological about that. Yes, and I'd be really curious to see um, what you're giving yourself permission to grieve or do right now. Uh, so today I'm giving myself permission to feel joy at connecting with all of you today. The, the gift of my mother's death is, and I can, I will call it a gift. Please don't tell other people that their grief is a gift. That's only something they can decide for themselves. Um, but is connecting with all of you and doing this work today. Yes. Um, Christine says to feel lonely. Uh, Kirk says to have a grieving heart with tears. Somebody else said, I give myself permission to feel unsure, anger, to feel mad, sad, cry, and be overwhelmed. I have permission to cry. I give myself permission to feel sad and lonely. Yes, and I just want to acknowledge the weight of all of these and how true they are. Please keep filling the chat with them because we love to see all the ways that you're giving yourself permission to grieve. And this is a ritual that you can do every single day, once a week. And again, for our visual learners, you can pin this up on a bulletin board, on a fridge, on a window or a kitchen cabinet to give yourself permission to grieve. So things I've heard from clients um, in the aftermath of loss and giving themselves more permission to grieve, they tell me, I feel like I'm more in touch with my feelings. I don't feel overwhelmed by the thoughts in my head. They feel like they have somewhere to go, which can be really helpful. My emotions feel normal. I'm not a bad person. And I'm not wrong for feeling them. Even though society and the world with that narrow range of what we're allowed to do makes me feel that way, I know that I am not bad or wrong. And then uh, lastly, I can give other people more space and permission to grieve. I can allow other people to have their emotional experiences instead of feeling awkward and going silent or maybe changing the subject. I have a better vocabulary for giving others permission to grieve because of how I've given myself permission to grieve. Um, kind of as we're wrapping up here, this is how you can find me in all of my work. Uh, the first two images on the top are books I've written thus far. There are more to come. Permission to Grieve, which was released in 2019, and Your Grief Your Way, which is a daily devotional non-religious uh, guide to life after loss that was released in September. And then the three podcasts I host are Grief Seeds, Coming Back, and Grief Book Review. If you'd like um, the first chapter of Permission to Grieve sent to your email for free, you can sign up at my website, which is shelbyforsythia.com, and it's all the way at the bottom in that footer there. That'll be next to my contact information at the very bottom of the website. And you can sign up and get the first chapter of that uh, book for free. This is the part where I'd love to open up the call to Q&A. So please submit questions to the Q&A section of the Zoom. And I will be um, taking your questions on grief, loss, permission to grieve in the workplace and family structures. How do I emotionally validate uh, people in the world? And I'll hand it over to Abby to help me uh, moderate as well. Thank you so much, Shelby. That was powerful and lovely. And I'm so wonderful, everybody. I'm so happy everybody could connect and share their ideas and stories in the chat here. So yes, exactly as Shelby just said, please feel to write, feel free to write your questions in the Q&A, um, upvote others' questions, and we'd love to hear from you some more. So let's go ahead with the first one that we have here now. Do you have any advice for talking with a sibling when the sibling doesn't have the same experience grieving the death of a parent as you do? They've had a different relationship with a parent or feel differently. 
Yeah. Well, I think the first thing is to acknowledge that, that the different relationship exists. So that's another way that you can give people permission to grieve is that I acknowledge or it makes sense that we had a different relationship with the person who died. Um, and then I see part of that question too, is it sometimes just better not to talk with them about the death that relates to your boundaries and how you'd like to have that conversation as well. Do you feel comfortable talking about um, the person, the parent who died? And if you'd like to open that door and what their boundaries are as well. So if they don't want to talk about it, maybe not an issue that you force say, I'm here when you're ready to talk about it, or it's something I'm interested in talking about and sharing and having a shared experience with you, but I'm not going to pressure you to share your experiences or your emotions with me. But yes, acknowledge first every, huh, we may lose the same person in a uh, family dynamic, especially. So my sister and I both lost the same person in losing my mother, but the ways we have grieved her are vastly different. And sometimes simply looking each other in the face over FaceTime lately because of COVID and saying, I miss mom, I miss her too, but in totally different ways is a really phenomenal way to open that door by just acknowledging that the difference exists in the first place. Thank you. Dante asks, my father died on Christmas day, making it difficult to forget, process and grieve. Do you have advice how to help uh, him and his family when Christmas comes around next year? Yeah, and this is hard and crappy and tricky. Um, my mom died the day after Christmas, so I resonate with that in you as well. Um, Christmas is uh, hot garbage. Without swearing on this, it is a really, really hard time to be alive. And I don't say that with any um, intention to take my life, but it's just a really hard time to be human. One of the best things that you can do, Dante, is um, to plan ahead for Christmas. And this involves kind of opening the door, again, permission to grieve, either with your family or other people that do Christmas with you normally and say, okay, so my dad died. This could be a grandparent in the family or a father-in-law to somebody else in the family. My dad died. How would we like to do Christmas now that this is true and real? Which traditions would we like to continue? Which traditions would we like to conclude? Which traditions would we like to start? Uh, because this is real and this happened. And this can be traditions just for you or traditions uh, and practices and rituals that expand across the group. And you can also say this year. So this doesn't mean we have to decide on a new tradition and this will go on and on and on forever and ever, amen. It could be, okay, this year is gonna feel really hard because not only are you grieving Christmas day, you're grieving Christmas and COVID, which is something that happened for so many people who lost last year. And so this year, what are we gonna do now that we are living with the truth and the reality that my father has died and that we are grieving um, perhaps very distant this year. Um, I will say too, Dante, at least in your wording, I don't know that you will ever forget your dad. I think that he will, um, his memory and his presence in your life and the ways in which he made you will continue on uh, with you for the rest of your life. And that's not a bad thing. That's exactly how grief works. So you're doing it right. Thanks. Maria asks, how do we get the message out to the world that grief feelings are normal? Oh, I love this. Thank you. It's like, how do we be the torch bearers for, <laughs> for permission to grieve? And that's exactly it. We become um, transmitters of permission to grieve. So there are, it depends on how you want to be an advocate. And this is related to so many other activist things that are happening in the world today. It's like, do you want to use your voice? Do you want to start petitions? Do you personally want to be a person who offers permission to grieve for other people? Or do you want to take this up on a legal or a corporate basis? There are, um, I believe, um, Modern Loss just led uh, a campaign within the Biden administration to offer bereavement leave for a greater bereavement leave within families who've experienced COVID-19. So that's something that's uh, happening in the world. So you can do like political or administrative movements that are actually helping change bereavement policies in corporate spaces. But on a really small and micro level is to take everything that you learned here today, the phrases that you offer to people and start practicing permission to grieve with your friends and family members, even teeny tiny. Some of my favorite experiences of offering permission to grieve are taking uh, lifts and Ubers in the city of Chicago, um, even two, three years ago when I did a lot more of that and I weren't <laughs> safer at home. Um, um, and I would get into conversation with Lyft drivers. And one time I was in a car with a, with a man who'd lost his son. And we just started talking about grief because I told him what I did. And I said, I'm so sorry. That must've been so hard for you. He's like, yeah, it was 21 years ago, but I think about him every day. And in that moment, instead of a closing of, oh, you must be so strong because you're continuing to live on without your child, blah, blah, blah. I offered this space of like, that must've been really hard 
He said, yeah, it really was. And it was 21 years ago and I miss him dearly. Mm -hmm. So you can offer permission to grieve in these kind of micro doses all around your life and be um, a person who's safe for grief. And then as people ask you, why are you such a safe place for grief? Or why do I feel so comfortable sharing things with you? You can share these tips and tools with them. I saw somebody in the chat say, are you on Audible? Yes, both of my books are on Audible if you'd like to listen to an audio book as well. Good, good to know. Um, Erne asked a practical question. How do I grieve at work and still try to get work done? <laughs> How do I ask permission from my job if I need more time to grieve? Yeah, um, something about grieving at work. And for what it's worth, this is not my area of expertise. There's a phenomenal um, woman by the name of Elisa Forneray, uh, A-L-I-C-A-F-O-R. N-E-R-E-T, uh, who does a lot of great work on grief in the workplace and how to actually approach bosses in a practical way or approach managers about permission to grieve in the workplace. Um, hmm. One of the practices that I taught in an online course is what do I have to do? What do I want to do? And what do I, what do I need to do today? And so how can you pare down what you're doing at work to allow space for your grief to exist as well? It's like, it'd be nice if you did this thing, maybe you don't necessarily have to do it. You can withdraw from committees or places where you're organizing things together that are optional as part of your work, at least for now. You can use this temporary language of right now for the time being in this moment, and then maybe come back to it later. So withdraw from things that are optional and only do what's necessary for you. And then when it comes to speaking to your bosses and, and managers, or maybe people who can offer you that time and space, um, I would send either an email or make a phone call or even have a face-to-face -face conversation if you're working in a place that's in person right now and say something along the lines of, hey, since X loss happened, I've had a hard time focusing on X, Y, Z. I wonder if there's a way to work together to make it so I feel like I have a little bit more flexibility to complete this project because it's still important to me, because this job matters to me, because I want to continue to stay here. And so kind of maintaining this eagerness for the job and I want to stay here and I want to do this thing. It's like, I'm not, I'm not asking for two weeks off to, you know, to, to vacation around the world. I'm asking for time off or a change in the flexibility of my schedule. Maybe I want to take half days or have that option for myself or come in later or whatever it may be to tend to my grief because I actually really care about this job and I want the work to get done in a way that's satisfying for all of us. And so showing that e earnestness and eagerness to the people that you're employed by can help open the door to how can we make this a reality. And kind of again with asking for permission with other people, if you get an immediate shutdown, maybe your workplace isn't a safe place for your grief. And that's a thing to also grieve and keep in mind as you are employed there. So if your workplace is not a safe place for your grief and all you get is shut down, shut down, shut down, where else in your life, if you have to stay at this job, which is a reality for so many people, if you have to stay at this job, where else in your life can you open those doors for yourself and allow yourself permission to grieve, whether that's with family, friends, hobbies, et cetera, where else can that grief live and be honored for you? Thank you for that. Karen asks, how do I get through the anger? I'm not an angry person, but since the deaths of both parents and her brother, she has a lot. Yeah, well, I think anger is closely tied to identity. And Karen, um, Karen, yes, is their name? It was Karen, yes. Karen, thank you. Yes, um, I'm going to make an assumption that you identify as a female person um, in this call. And there's especially a societal norm that women are not angry. And angry women are bad or B words or vindictive, or they have something mentally wrong with them. And especially growing up, if you were in a religious household, if you were in some kind of um, part of the world or part of the country that was a little more traditional, there really might be this pressure, this role of like, women don't get angry. And if women get angry, something is wrong with them. And so something that you might start to do in the aftermath of loss, and this is a lot of the work I do with one-on-one -on -one clients, is how you have changed as a person as a result of the loss that has happened in your life because you cannot experience a loss without it also changing you in some way. Grief makes us a different person and it doesn't make you a different person in that you become a monster and there would, nobody wants to be around you. But there are things in your life that shift as a result of you having this information, having had this experience, having had this great loss in your life. And that's okay. That's how grief works is it changes you as a person. For instance, we're a different country after Hurricane Katrina, we have changed as a country. So why would you not also change as a person when a great loss happens in your life? So maybe the first step for you, Karen, is to start identifying is, 
interesting. Grief has made me an angry person, bring in permission to grieve. And that makes sense. Of course, grief would make me an angry person or the loss would make me an angry person and allowing that to be an open doorway. Cause so, so now that I'm an angry person, how do I want permission to grieve? And it's not, I'm an angry person 24 seven. It could just be, I'm an angry person right now. I'm an angry person today. I'm an angry person in this moment. So how can I give myself permission to grieve in those spaces? Yeah. Interesting. Thanks. Um, Diane and uh, a couple others have asked for tips to move forward. Maybe not move on entirely, but move mm -hmm. forward. This is it. I mean, this is kind of a cop-out answer, but the, the entirety of this workshop is it. So allowing grief to come with you through routines, through mementos, through memorials, allowing yourself constant permission to grieve as you move forward in your life. This is how you keep, maintain momentum. And let me tell you something. There's such a myth in the aftermath of loss that you are stuck that you're not going anywhere, that you're not doing anything. And a lot of this has been amplified by COVID because we're really not allowed to go anywhere or do anything. So as you start telling yourself these stories, if I'm stuck in my grief, I'm not going anywhere, I'm not healing, I'm not coping, of course it feels like these stories are true. It makes sense that you're telling, bring permission to grieve in again. You're allowed to have all these stories to be true. And I was working with a client the other day who's not left her house in three weeks after the death of her father. He was a major artist and public figure in the neighborhood. And she's like, every time I go out, somebody has to tell me a story about my dad and I just can't take it. And I said, it's okay that you're not doing a lot externally right now, that it doesn't feel like you're moving forward because so much is happening in here. Your head, your brain is trying to figure out where grief goes in the grand timeline of your life. And your heart is trying to wrestle with feelings that it may have never had before. So in this feeling of stuckness, in this feeling or the story of I am not moving forward, there's actually a great amount of momentum that's happening. Really phenomenal way to prove that this is true to yourself, because sometimes our brains need evidence that this is actually a process that's happening, is to keep maybe a one-sentence journal or a one-sentence diary. And even giving yourself permission to grieve can be an example of this. Today, I gave myself permission to cry. Today, I gave myself permission to feel sad. Today, I gave myself permission to have a conversation with my aunt who I haven't called in a long time. Today, I gave myself permission to feel numb. And you can see kind of as the ways that permission changes, you can see the ways that you are growing in the midst of your grief and allowing yourself to expand and have new experiences, even emotionally in the aftermath of loss. And that is its own brand and its own kind of moving forward. Thanks. I, we have a minute left, and so I'm going to leave you with one more question. Sure. Um, someone asked, and I've lost their name now, um, about thriving after grief. Can you speak to that at all? Not only allowing it in, but thriving in your life after a difficult loss. Yeah. Um, I'll share a, a tip from one of my favorite people. And I wish I could remember her name. She came on the podcast sometime in season eight. Um, but she said, at least in life after loss, something that really helped was not aiming for happiness again, but aiming for neutral. Um, because sometimes happiness seems such like a high or a lofty goal. It seems impossible to achieve when you're way down here in the depths and in the darknesses of grief. And so to just aim for neutral, just aim for something that feels okay, content, routine, maybe even boring. And then as you get to that space, it's like, okay, so now more and more, my norm is boring, routine, feeling okay about my life. And from that place is where you start to step into thriving. One of the biggest indicators of thriving in life after loss is when, when desire comes back. I want, again, I, I want to be happy in my life again, I want to make meaning of my loss through a nonprofit or by founding something or by putting a bench in a park. I want to produce something from my grief. I want to write a book. Um, I want to connect with other people about my loss. So when the words I want or I desire start coming into your life again, that's, that's a symbol that you are thriving in life after loss. And also I'll leave you with this one last caveat. Things like joy, things like happiness, things like grace, things like love will always feel different in the aftermath of loss. They will not feel the same as they used to in life before loss. They may not feel as, as pure or as whole because they always have little dregs of grief attached to them. 
as you fall in love, you will remember that your person who always approved of partners or met them on dates and things like that is not here to approve of them anymore, to give their insight. As you have weddings or things like that, the person who is a witness to your life is no longer present. And also, as you have these experiences of joy and as you have these experiences of love, they're beautiful opportunities in your thriving to step back and say, look at me continuing to experience love, continuing to experience joy, insisting on being happy even in the aftermath of this grief. And so the grief kind of becomes foundational for how you step into thriving again. Thriving is built upon the fact that you have grieved. And that in and of itself, I hesitate to use the word strength, but that's, that's a source of your resilience. That's a source of your post-traumatic growth. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you for sharing that and for sharing everything with us. And and you're thriving as well after you through your grief oh, thank, thank you everyone here as well it was such a poignant session and i'm so thrilled that everybody could share and connect in our chat as well if you want more information on grief happify has a brand new four week track called heal from grief and loss and a whole packet of resources including articles like how to help someone you love deal with grief Thank you again to everyone for being here today. Thank you, Shelby, for a beautiful presentation. And I wish you all a lovely rest of your day.